little harder pass there. Oh, I can actually see where it will be. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you again for taking the time to be here and listening to this case, listening to the state's pros, listening to everything that's gone on for the past two days. You know, I said this to you yesterday, we know jury service is a burden that takes you away from your lives, and we really do appreciate you taking the time and being here and paying attention. And it's important because at the heart of this, something serious did happen. At the heart of this, there are numerous missing firearms, and no one knows where they are. There are multiple missing guns, and that's something that the state takes incredibly seriously. On October 1st, 2018, after having been served with a restraining order on September 17th, Herbert Green went to his home, a place he knew he was barred from, and he took his guts. Acton chose both of his sons, although reluctantly, <coughs> did admit their father did. Both sons told you their dad was there on October 1st. He placed his belongings into his brother's car, and this truly left. Then, on November 14, 2018, Herbert Reed went to the Pemberton Township Police Department for an escort back to his house. He was advised of the weapons prohibition again, in person this time, and Herbert Reed lied to Officer Sawyer and told him that the guns were in the house. And when he got to the house, he realized, and she discovered that they weren't there, he lied again about what happened to them, or didn't happen to them. Now, at the beginning of this case, I told you that you have a job to do, and that job has three parts. The first part is assessing the credibility of the witnesses. And this is clearly a case that comes down to credibility. Who do you believe? Following the law that Judge Bill is going to give you in a little while and using that common sense. Because that common sense is going to lead you to the right result. That common sense is going to tell you what the most logical, the most reasonable, but the most truthful version of the facts actually is. Now, as a result of the defendant's actions on November 14th, he's charged with obstruction and violation of a restraining order. Judge Williams, I'm going to give you that law for a while, so I'm not going to go over it all again. I know I gave you the basic elements yesterday. But ladies and gentlemen, this is really not a complex case. It's a case of credibility, like I said, and it comes down to that question of who's telling the truth. It's your job to decide who you think is telling the truth. Let's go over what we do know about what happened here. You heard from Officer Jack yesterday, testify yesterday, that he was on duty on September 17th. He was given a task. Hey, go serve this restraining order on Herbert Reed. He needs to be served. He was given a phone number that led to Mr. Reed. But he was told by Central Communications, who is Mr. Reed's number? He calls that number. The person picks up and says, identifies themselves as Herbert Reed. You question that? The person on the phone identifies themselves as Herbert Reed and says, I'm also a corrections officer. The job officer Jet knew was the, Mr. Reed's occupation from the restraining order. Officer Jet has a conversation with them, with the person on the phone. And he, he told you it stood out to him that Mr. Reed was a corrections officer because Officer Jett was a former corrections officer. So it's something that stuck out in his mind. And he specifically remembers going over the weapons prohibition because as a former corrections officer and as a current police officer, he knows that officers have guns. He wanted to make sure he knew that he told Herbert Reed, you can't have your guns. So he specifically remembers going over that weapons prohibition. There was no doubt in his mind when he testified before you yesterday that he told him that. There was no doubt in his mind that he spoke to Herbert Reed. No, he had never met Mr. Reed before. No, he'd never heard him, he'd never spoken to him on the phone before, so he didn't know his voice. But if you're given a phone number that's supposed to lead to a person, you call that number, and the person who picks up the phone says, hey, I'm Herbert Reed, and identifies himself as a corrections officer, which is what the person's job is, would you doubt that? I know officers are trained to be skeptical of everything, but is that something that you would be skeptical of? It makes sense. 
Officer Jet read him all the relevant portions of the restraining order. You can't go back to the house. You can't have contact with her. You can't have other people contact her. You can't have your guns. Then he updates service in the restraining in ETRO, the restraining order system. And he told you he has his own login, he has his own password, nobody else knows it. You log in, you put in the restraining order information, you click service, and it puts his name, the date, the time, covered in the township police department. So that way, everybody else who has access to the system knows who served it. So that if it ever becomes an issue, like it has here, they know who to contact. The entire purpose of that. Now, Ms. Geller Gorman has made a very large point of the fact that Officer Jack did not know who he was talking to on the phone. But here's the issue with the idea that it wasn't Herbert Reed on that phone. Let's say it was a wrong number. Number he was given, Officer Jet was given. He calls somebody else. He calls John Smith by accident. The number actually is John Smith's number. John Smith would have said, "Hey, dude, sorry, you got the wrong number." Okay, so it's not a wrong number. Which only leads to the idea that if it wasn't a agreement on the phone, it wasn't a wrong number. That's implying that there's. Somebody trying to set up Mr. Reed to make it look like he's been served with this restraining order when he has it. And that makes no sense. If it was a conspiracy to set up Mr. Reed to get in trouble for violating a restraining order, wouldn't somebody have had to report him for violating a restraining order? And he was never reported for violating a restraining order prior to November 14th. Nobody called the police and said, hey, he went back to the house. Nobody called the police and said, hey, he contacted her, or he did, or he had somebody else contact her, or he did something else he wasn't supposed to do. That never happened. Mr. Reed went to the police department. His sons never called the police and said, hey, my dad went back to the house and took his guns. Simone Seymour never called the police and reported a violation, and he told, she told you yesterday. It didn't occur to her that when the guns went missing, he called the police. It just didn't. She also told you she didn't know the restraining order had been served. So if it wasn't Mr. Reed on the phone, and it wasn't a wrong number, then it's some big conspiracy that has a big gaping hole at the end of it. it makes no sense. Now, Zella Gorman also made a point about the fact that Officer Jet didn't keep his notes, that he didn't record the number, he didn't verify that number in any way. Officer Jet told you. He's required to keep notes on cases that involve crimes, indictable offenses. He's not required to keep notes on service of restraining orders. So as nefarious as that may seem, he's not required to. His note was a phone number on a piece of paper that he called, and then he entered the restraining order service into the system. That was it. He also told you he didn't send a copy of the restraining order to Mr. Reed because Mr. Reed told him he was going to come down the next day to get a copy of it. Yeah, isn't it? As it may would have been amazingly awesome best practices to send a copy anyway. Sure. But he didn't do that because he was told that Mr. Reed was going to come down and get a copy the next day. Seems a lot faster to wait the 24 hours for somebody to come get the restraining order than mail it. And obviously, and, Mr. and Officer Jack said he doesn't know that Mr. Reed did or didn't come the next day because there was a shift change. Once you leave your shift, you don't, mess, you don't know what's happening on the next shift. He was very honest and forthcoming with you about that. Now, you also heard from Officer Sawyer. And Officer Sawyer said that Mr. Reed came into the station on November 14th asking for an escort to his home to get all of his to collect some of his personal belongings. Officer Sawyer told you she saw the weapons prohibition, saw that he was a corrections officer, and asked about his guns. He told her, yeah, we have these guns. Here's where I keep them. She said, okay. And went out to the house. When they got there, Ms. Seymour was in the driveway. Hold on, wait over here. We have to go kind of deal with this part of it. 
Now, when she arrived, she spoke with Simone Seymour. And Ms. Seymour told her, as she indicated yesterday on the stand, John's not here. Now, she said, I don't remember, she, probably, she said yesterday, I don't know exactly what I said, but I said something to the effect of the guns aren't there. Officer Sora goes upstairs and she testified, she told me yesterday, virtually everything was cleaned out of that closet, of the gun part. It was cleared where the guns used to be. She said that what was left was some dummy round, a gun cleaning kit, and a couple boxes. No rifle, no shotgun, no handguns, and empty safe. Now, Bella Gorman's also made a huge deal about the fact that the safe is left wide open. Well, there's nothing in the safe. Why do you have to close the safe? Does it really matter if it's left open, if there's nothing in it? If it's not protecting anything, why would you lock it? Why would you shut it? Officer Sawyer also did not assume that Herbert Reed did something nefarious here. She told you she conducted an investigation. The guns were not there. She spoke to Mr. Reed. She spoke to his sons. She did an investigation. And after doing an investigation that led her to Herbert Reed, that's when he got that's when she charged him. She did not make a mistake in not looking into Miss Seymour. She spoke to Miss Seymour. She spoke to Lord Reed. She spoke to Prince Reed. She did an investigation, which is what officers are trained to do. Her investigation led her to that man, which is why he's charged. There was no mistake made with Simone Seymour. She also, Miss Seymour, and I know I'm jumping a little bit, didn't deny knowing if the safe was open. She said, I don't remember if the safe was open. She's being very honest with you. She didn't make it up and say, yeah, the safe was open, or no, the safe wasn't open. She said, I don't remember. This was almost a year ago at this point in time. She was being truthful. You also heard Lord Reed testify. You heard him tell you he was uncomfortable. You could see how uncomfortable he was. But he was here. He was nervous and clearly very anxious. He told you the memory was a little bit blurry about what happened last fall. But he also told you that his written statement was truthful. The statement that he wrote out on November 14th was correct. He also told you no one told him what to say. Skelly Gorman asked him that, and he said, no. He was not told what to say. That was his statement, his words. His handwriting, his words. He made that statement. He said that on October 1st, 2018, his father came to 47 Homestead Drive in front of it. He came to get his guns, his ammunition, and some of his stuff from the house. He said in his statement that his brother was there and his uncle was there. Stella Foreman made a point that, you know, he said Uncle Harry, but they know him as Uncle Billy. Does it matter what name he used? It's his uncle. He identified which uncle it was. Some families have multiple names for people. This family is one of them. He identified his uncle. He didn't say it was Uncle John and it was actually Uncle Steve. He said it was Uncle Harry. He said that his father retrieved, and this is in his written statement, an AR-15, a shotgun, which was a bag. He said that there was a handgun in the trash bag. He said that the rest of the guns were in a shoebox. He testified that he saw the guns leaving the house. There was nothing unclear. He was nervous, a little bit shaky, but he stood by that written statement. Did he sound like he was lying to you? Did he seem like he was being dishonest and like he was hiding something? Or did you just seem really nervous? Because he's a young kid who's having to testify against his father. He was nervous. You also heard from Prince Reed, who was clearly frustrated at being here and did not 
want to justify against his father. I told you that yesterday. I was very forthcoming with all of you that I had no idea how they were going to act or react on the stand and that they did not want to be here. And I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to testify against my family members, but they came. They did testify. And that says a lot. Consider Prince's tone, his demeanor, and how he answered the questions asked. He was a little bit more unsure about what happened. But despite his agitation at being here, he told you his father was at the house on October 1st. He didn't hide that. He told you he was pissed at being woken up and having to go to the house to supervise what he called this petty nonsense between his parents because his mother was worried about her things going missing. He was very clear that he was there on October 1st. He clearly remembers it. He remembers being in and out of the house a little bit. He's like, as long as my mother's stuff wasn't being taken, I didn't care. I told you that several times. He wasn't iffy on the date. He knows he was there on October 1st. He remembers it. And you heard his, him acknowledge that he testified previously that there was no doubt in his mind that his father removed firearms from that house on October 1st. Yesterday, he was a little bit more iffy. He's like, well, I saw the gun boxes being taken out. That's where my father usually kept some of the guns, but I never looked in the boxes. But he did admit to you, he did testify, that he previously said there was no doubt in his mind that his father removed those guns from the house. No. You also heard from Jen Fly. I'm not going to go into everything Jen Fly talked about because she was really trying to explain the process to all of you, how this works, how service works, why there were two different restraining orders because there was something wrong with one of them, which is why Herbert Reed had to be served again because the one restraining order from September 17th was different from the restraining order from November 14th. So even if you're served with one, you've got to be served with the other. That's why she was here. But finally, you heard from the defendant. You heard from Mr. Reed. He told you he raised his children to be honest, respectful of law enforcement, to do the right thing, to respect their mother, to pick her at all costs. One of his sons even became a member of law enforcement. But here's the problem with Mr. Reed's testimony. He wants you all to believe that his children, his incredibly hardworking, accomplished children, are lying to you. Lying to the system that he taught them how to protect, that he taught them to respect. And it just doesn't make any sense. Why would his son, who is a member of law enforcement, who told you yesterday, he's testified hundreds of times, why? What do his kids have to gain from this? This is not a case of a woman scorned. Simone Seymour has nothing to gain from this. She didn't call the police. She didn't report a violation of a restraining order. This is not a child custody dispute where she has something to gain from hitting her children against their father. This is not what's going on. Prince and Lord have no way to lie. Anything. They would have read it a lie the other way. Get their father out of trouble. They're not doing that. Simone Seymour's only connection to this case is that she had the restraining order that kind of started this whole thing. It doesn't matter why she had the restraining order, there was a restraining order. She also just happened to pull into her driveway at the wrong time. Now, for the defendant's version of events to be true, let's break this down a little bit. Here are the things that you have to believe. You have to believe that the patrolman Jet is wrong about serving the restraining order on September 17th that he either was inexperienced and screwed up, or that there's some big conspiracy that somebody else was on the phone pretending to be Herbert Reed, making it look like he was served, and that no one called the police to report anything. You have to believe that Lord Reed was wrong when he told the police that his father was home on October 1st and was contacted. He was contacted about his dad coming to get his stuff out of the house. 
you'd have to believe that Lord, wrong, Lord Reed was wrong about his father actually being there on the first and taking things out of the house. You'd have to believe that Lord Reed is lying about seeing the guns, and he detailed those guns in his statement, that left the house. You'd have to believe that Prince Reed, who was a sworn member of law enforcement, and a detective in a very difficult department, who clearly did not want to be here and testify, against his father is lying about his father being there on October 1st. There was nothing unclear about what Prince Reed said. You'd have to believe that Prince Reed lied in his prior testimony, which was given much closer in time to the incident, that there was not a doubt in his mind that his father took those guns out of the house. You'd have to believe that everyone is conspiring against her. Those are all the things that you'd have to believe for Mr. Reed's version of events to be true. Or you can believe the most logical version of events. You can believe that Herbert Reed was served with a restraining order in September that told him not to go back to the house, went back to the house on October 1st and removed his guns, and then he went to the Denver Detention Police Department on November 14th to be served with that different restraining order and to collect his warning. He didn't tell you he left with nothing. So he had to go back to get his stuff. And when he went to the police department, he lied about where his son's were. That's more logical. That's more reasonable. That makes more sense based on everything else we've heard. Now here's one of the most important pieces of information I can leave you with. Even if you have some doubt in your mind but whether or not Officer Jet served that restraining order on September 17th, it doesn't matter. Because the second that Herbert Reed was served with that restraining order on November 14th, he was under the same requirement to lawfully to turn over all of his guns and tell the police where they were. Herbert Reed is not charged with violating a restraining order on October 1st. He is charged with violating a restraining order on November 14th, because he did not disclose the location of his firearms. So it doesn't matter if you don't believe that Herbert Reed was served on November, or September 17th. All that matters is that Herbert Reed was served on November 14th and then didn't turn over his guns. And he does not dispute that he was served on November 14th. You heard him say that from the stand. Now, in a few minutes, you're going to go back to the jury deliberation room after Judge Freeland has instructed you in the law. The evidence that you saw, the documents that are all in evidence, are going to go back with you. You're going to also take back the law that Judge Freeland gives you, and you're going to take back that common sense that you have. And I'm going to I submit to you that if you take that evidence, the testimony, and the documents that are sitting right there, you apply the law that Judge Freeland instructs you on, and you use your common sense, be able to hold Herbert Reed responsible for his actions on November 14, 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, if you do all of that, you will find Herbert Reed guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of obstruction for lying about where his guns are and violation of a restraining order for failing to turn over his firearm as he's legally required to do. Thank you. Thank you.